Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open to be a part of the program. It's free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624, or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off the second special edition episode we're doing this week. This episode is live Saturday night at 9 o'clock p.m. We ask you to join us either by phone, 1-855-450-NOAH, or in our interactive mumble room, mumble.jupiterbroadcasting.org. Now, this episode is going to be a little bit meta because it's a broadcast about broadcasting. Fred Gleason from Paravel Systems is going to join us talking about how he built a purpose-built, Linux-based, open-source-based broadcasting appliance. Now, I have a lot of experience with this particular device because it is the heart and soul of the Ask Noah studio. I've said many, many times there is not a Mac or Windows PC in the studio, and there never will be. But we have lots of Linux running in here. And at the heart of all that is our Rivendell broadcast machine. It handles everything from the intro that you just heard to clips that we play throughout the show. And when I found out that Fred Gleason himself was a huge Linux nerd, I knew that you, the Ask Noah Show audience, would want to hear from him to hear why he decided to base his broadcasting appliance, which is used in hundreds of stations worldwide, on Linux and used open source software. Although, I'm guessing you probably have an idea. So stay tuned for that. That's coming up later in the program. Joining me right now, I'm going to see if he's here, is our second guest this hour, and it is Eric, the IT guy. Hey, Eric, welcome back. I know it's been a long time. It has, but uh, happy that you can be here with us. So for those of you who aren't aware, you might remember Eric. He's been on the air a couple of different times talking about some of the very cool things that, that he is working on. And Eric has a passion for community. Eric has a passion for promotion and advocating for technology. And Eric has become uh, my go-to guy for new technologies as it relates to reaching to new communities and getting the message out. And a lot of you know that Google plays a lot of games with YouTube. And it can be very frustrating for some of us independent content producers who just want to make content and let the world see it. Depending on your political persuasion, depending on the kind of content that you're making, YouTube says, "Mm, sorry, you can't put it out there. Well, Eric has a solution to that, and it's a self-hosted solution, something that anybody can spin up with just a little bit of know-how, and he's going to share that with us tonight. So, hey, Eric, uh, tell me a little bit about PeerTube. So, um, for those of you that have been around the show uh, for any amount of time know that I've kind of become the de facto uh, PeerTube administrator in our community, and uh, it, it wasn't just wasn't just by chance it was it was something that uh, that i heard about on another program and really fell in love with the concept so peertube is an open source project and, and disclaimer i'm i'm just a i'm just a consumer of, of the product i don't represent their their project uh, by by any means but uh, I, i'm i'm here I, I i wanted to talk with with noah and with you all tonight about it just because I, i'm really excited about the technology about how far they've come in the past uh, six months um, and and it's a project that, that der- deserves some recognition. They deserve a shout out and and uh, and your support. Um, so so that being said, um, I, I'm a huge PeerTube fanboy, if you will. Um, I've I manage two or three different instances for different communities, and it, it's it's an amazing take on something that we kind of take for granted. Um, so so as Noah alluded to, there was uh, there's YouTube and, and Google likes to play games with that, and there's other solutions like Vimeo and and Twitch and that kind of thing. But none of those do you do you get to look inside that black box? None none of those solutions do you get to uh, to own your content. Once you once you upload it, you're you're at the mercy of of Google or Vimeo or Twitch, um, basically Amazon. Uh, and so one of the, one of the problems that, that we've we've seen in, in broadcasting, especially uh, if you get more into say politics or um, if you get into uh, potential copyright situations, 
uh, Google has an AI that basically scans through every video on, on YouTube and determines whether or not you're, you're in compliance uh, with, with their complex algorithms. And uh, one of the problems that can happen with that is if you play copyrighted material, you can get flagged and your video will be de demonetized. So if you lean on YouTube to be part of your, your income stream uh, to support your show or, or uh, to support your family, then, then Google's AI is going to, to kind of be the the judge and, and jury on that, mm. and, and really the executioner. Yeah. I mean, there there was a there was a show that was uh, there was a show from uh, from Jupiter Broadcasting called Unfilter, and these these their their content over at JP was constantly getting getting demonetized because they would play clips from major news broadcasts. Um, and then there was, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it might have been Blender. There, there was another open source project that that had uh, content out on out on YouTube, and their content was getting flagged for for playing clips of their own content on on their channel. So they're getting demonetized for for referring back to their own their own content, which is just unbelievable. And there's not there's not a simple number that you can call. There's there's not a customer support line that you can go to and say, hey, this is what happened. Um, this is why I don't think this should be demonetized. You you have to you have to just troll through Google's forums and and try and ping their their support staff and leave phone calls and, and voice messages. I mean, you're you're talking about a maze that never ends. I've I've heard from many people that it it is it is nothing short of miraculous to get Google to reverse a decision like that. Um, they they put all of their all their faith in their AI. How difficult is PeerTube to set up? Like, let's say I want to set up my own instance. Uh, is it is it a time invasive project? Is there a lot of technical know how, or is it one of those deals where you pull a Docker image and in five minutes you're up and running? And that's that's really the beauty of PeerTube is you can you can deal with all of that from Google or from Vimeo or from Amazon, or you can spend. I, I think the second time we we as a as a community set up PeerTube, it took less than thirty minutes. the The beauty of PeerTube is it is think of it as as a conglomeration of torrent technology, a web front end, a, a, a load balancer, and um, and and a and a and just storage. Sure. Um, so it's it's uh, it uses npm and nginx on on the front end, and it uses torrent technology for uh, for for sharing your your content, and then uh, then it's just a, a basic web web server on the back end that's that's uh, keeping track of all the videos once you upload it. It's it, I mean it it is really simple to get set up. Their documentation and their community is amazing. They've they've got an IRC room uh, where I've gotten tons of help. Um, uh, I ran into some issues with with the Nginx uh, during during the initial build. Uh, in fact, one one of the one of uh, in, in the Telegram group, there's some discussion about Linux Rocks uh, dot online, which is a Mastodon instance that is hosted for the Linux community. So one of the first things we did is we set up a PeerTube instance for people uh, in, in the in the Mastodon community. Um, so people like myself who are just getting started in, in broadcasting can upload their content onto a tool that they can be assured is is being managed by people with with similar thoughts, it's or, or similar philosophies. You so know, the, uh, I just the uh, of just a quick uh, shameless self promotion. That ma that well, you know what's coming, right? That Mastodon community actually spun up in the Ask Noah group. That was a, a bunch of Ask Noah members. That when we first launched the show, that my the original question I put forth forth to the group was, where can we go, or where can I go, where one place can I go where I can get community feedback, and where can we have a discussion? And there was a number of discussions about maybe spinning up uh, our own um, Discord server. And uh, then there was some talk about just doing everything on Reddit. And there was some talk about just keeping everything on Telegram. I think we had a, a few people who were born in the 19, you know, uh, 40s who were still stuck on everybody staying in IRC. No offense, that's just a joke. But uh, and, and eventually what we came up with is it would be nice to have social media, but it would be nice to have social media that wasn't censored. And thus the Mastodon community popped up. And uh, I haven't been as involved as I would like to be, but I would like to make that a priority in uh, in 2019 going forward. Um, to be more involved with the Mastodon community because I do really respect and appreciate what you guys have built up over there. Well, and it's it, it was a logical progression, really. I mean, one of the reasons why Mastodon was chosen for the Asnoa community 
was because it was something that could be federated. It was something that we could host and and moderate ourselves as a community. And and, and like yourself, I'm I'm trying to spend more time on, on Mastodon, but PeerTube was a logical extension of that. Uh, just because it it can be federated, it we 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 control the content as a community. Uh, we have moderators that go out there and make sure that uh, that anything that's not quite appropriate is, is marked appropriately, or 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 uh, uh, you know contacts the the content owner and and asks politely that it either be marked not safe for work or or that it be removed um, is, is moderated within the community. So so to answer your original question, uh, no, it was. Uh, PeerTube is, is pretty easy to set up. Right now, we're running it on uh, Ubuntu. Uh, I think it's uh, I think uh, the the instances I'm managing right now are running on Ubuntu 18.04. Um, but uh, one of the one of the one of the places I want to I want to test out next, and, and maybe for the for the IT uh, for the IT guy podcast is is going to be a Docker image. Um, so if if you're into Docker and containerization, I mean, within minutes you can just uh, you can just pull the pull the Docker image and, and spin it up and start uploading content. I'm just going to ask this because I know there's going to be people on YouTube that are going to ask, what kind of content do you plan on censoring on the PeerTube instance? Um, there's there's not a lot that we censor at the moment. Um, uh, I mean, really, it's it, it's supposed to be family friendly. Um, so, I mean, really lewd or or you know, pornographic type material is about the only thing we've come across thus far that that has actually been asked to, to be brought down, um, and and I think that's I think that's something that the community understands is that it's it, it's it's community driven project, and so that everybody's everybody's opinion is is welcome, and in fact I, I've seen some conversations pop up around. Uh, around videos that have been posted from both sides of any particular topic. So it's a great place to get um, a variety of opinions, a variety of backgrounds. So there's there's not a lot of moderation goes on. It's it's this really a self-moderated community. How responsive is PeerTube as compared to YouTube? So one of the reasons that I think a lot of people drive to YouTube is because when I click on a YouTube link, I know that link is going to load instantaneously. Whereas, you know, even even other major social media platforms like Facebook, oftentimes their players are not quite as responsive. So, what? How, how does that? How does PeerTube relate there? That's that's where Torrent becomes the beautiful piece of this. This is this is what I think sets PeerTube apart from a lot of the other, a lot of the other platforms. Um, if there's one person watching a video, is it's just a it's just a just a straight stream. Um, I, I forget what the what the protocol is on the back end, but it's just it's just a stream off of the protocol web of the uh, PeerTube web server. But where where PeerTube really shines is when you get two, three, four, twenty, a hundred people watching a video. You when you're watching that video, you become a seeder. So in in torrent terminology, you are hosting a copy of that video on your system and you share it out with other people. So like like a like a transmission client or something if if you're downloading you know an ISO and you're you're seeding that back um, you're you're it, when you're the next person in line then you're getting that that content not from one server but from multiple different clients that are watching the video at the exact same time so the more popular your video gets on PeerTube the better performance it's going to be Talk to me a little bit about the, uh, ads on PeerTube. Are there ads on Pure, Pure, PeerTube? What if I want to have ads? If they're not native ads, can I, as the host hoster of this service, can I layer ads or incorporate ads to monetize my videos like you can with YouTube? Uh, to to date, there isn't any type of uh, any type of ad revenue service. Um, there is, however, a a, a a text field on every video that you can go in and post. It's it's a support section. So right now you can post links to um, either either your your PayPal or your your GoFundMe or or you know even your Ethereum wallet because <laughs> none of us like Bitcoin anymore. So you know definitely go like Ethereum. I can't. <laughs> Again, Eric, the IT guy, my guest this hour on the Ask Noah show. I I we're not screening calls tonight, so I can't tell you definitively that this is related to uh, PeerTube. Might have nothing to do with it, but are you okay taking a call, Eric? Oh, for sure. 1-855-450. No, it's 855-450-6624. Or send us an email live at asknoahshow.com. You're on Ask Noah. What's on your mind? Hey, no, Eric. It's Elijah. Uh, doesn't have anything to do with Peer 2, but hey, I've got a DJ gig possibly in December, and I'm wondering if you could help me out with software, hardware, top to bottom. 
Yeah. What do you recommend? Yeah, no worries. Um, so actually, man, you called the two right guys for this. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I tell you what, I will let Eric take the light side. I will take the sound side. So, uh, Eric, why don't you go first? What would you recommend if, uh, if Elijah here is going to do uh, lights for a DJ event? Uh, if you're doing lights for a DJ event, I definitely call Let, let There Be Light. Okay, so... <laughs> So that, for those of it, you that it, don't get for those of you that don't get the joke, that's Eric's business. He's a professional light guy for a DJ company. Now that we've all had our laugh, <laughs> let's help Elijah. Um, so, so as a as a as a lighting guy, as someone who works in production and works in IT, um, and I like to 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 own my own technology, I would definitely be running lighting under uh, under Linux, and. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the software. I can I can find it just a second here. Um, I'm gonna I'll go ahead and take the sound while while uh, while uh, Eric looks that up. So I uh, for sound I recommend as far as software goes I recommend the open source app Mix M I X X X. Fantastic, very highly developed professional software that is extraordinarily robust and very reliable. Available for free in the repos. You can just go ahead and install it on, on your favorite distro. Now, that's all you need to play music. If you just go to Amazon, purchase your music legally, or buy some CDs and rip them, install Mix, you can do everything through the Mix UI. That's not my recommendation, though, because when you're playing music, when you're, when you are, when you're playing music, especially for a live event, being able to fire those tracks at the exact right millisecond is everything. So when you've got a dance groove going on and you're trying to beat match and, and do all of those things, trying to get a mouse right over the right spot and click the button or trying to use the keyboard, I just don't find it to be a very responsive responsive way to do that, Elijah. And so what I use is I use a Pioneer um, DJ controller. Now, the one that we use is the DJ DDJ SB3. How's that for a model number? We'll have a link for you in the show notes, but it's a $249 uh, DJ controller surface. And essentially it plugs in through the USB port. It has native Linux drivers available. And essentially what we can do is it allows us to control all of the fun functions of mix from a hardware platform. The other thing I like about that particular board is it also includes a built-in audio interface. So you get unbalanced audio that's coming out of it and you're able to feed that directly into your PA system. And so that one device is essentially the bridge between your laptop and the rest of your system. And the laptop just kind of hangs off the system and, and does the heavy lifting. Uh, Eric, are you back with us? Yeah, and I can I can definitely echo uh, mix. I mean, as a as a lighting designer, uh, I mean that's that's the primary drive of my business. But occasionally I get get asked to to DJ on breaks and that kind of thing. And um, so it, it's great to just take my Linux laptop, hook hook it up. I I use a touchscreen at the moment, but uh, it's mix is fairly responsive under a touchscreen. But it's it's not as responsive as I would like. Um, like you said, you know, if you're trying to beat match every every little uh, delay in your in your uh, input is is important. Um, now, for my setup, I'm running a Grand MA on PC, um, which is probably a lot more involved than uh, than what you're looking for as as a DJ. Um, so the the name of the software and it and it does run under Linux is called QLC Plus. Mm. Um, I think that's the one I've used in the past, and it's it's great, especially if you just need static scenes or or a little bit of uh, or a few chases here and there. Um, it works really, really well. Um, I, and if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I think you can even write code. It it's, I, it may take Python. I wouldn't swear to that, but uh, I think you can actually write scripts and, and call those scripts from within QLC Plus. So you can actually you can actually design your own effects literally from the ground up. I uh, a second uh, a second vote for QLC Plus. I use it uh, with a hardware. Uh, DMX controller called uh, the DMX King, and so it's or sorry, hardware inter DMX interface is really what it is. Um, so I'll have a link to both the Pioneer DJ controller, uh, QLC Plus, and also I'll throw a link into another board that I am familiar with. It's not quite as high as quality as the Pioneer board, but it also doesn't carry the, <laughs> the expensive price tag of it as well. And it is the M Audio DJ controller, and so uh, we'll have links to all of that in the show notes as well as a link to the DMX King uh, DMX interface. Sweet, that's great. So it goes laptop, DMX controller, and then like a, a mixer, uh, powered amplifier, and then your speakers? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, yeah, I, you can do that. Um, I've done it both ways. If we're doing a wedding, 
oftentimes you'll have people that want to make speeches and um, or you'll have uh, audio video guys that want to incorporate like a slideshow or something like that. If you're doing those things, you'll definitely want to have an external mixer because it'll allow you to bring in multiple audio sources and send it out over the PA system. If you're just doing music, I have multiple times run the uh, the DJ audio interface directly into the power amplifier and then out to the speakers. Or if you're one of these, you know, new hot kids that use these powered speaker jobbies, then you could do that. Um, and so you could run the, so then all you would need is your laptop, the controller and the speakers. And I want to emphasize again, you can do it, especially if you're just getting started, might not be a bad idea to get started with just the laptop, a good high quality auto inter interface, like the lexicon alpha or the, um, what's the red one that focus, right? That everyone uses, uh, one of those would, would get you by as well. But again, if it's my money, I'm probably buying a dedicated controller because again, that physical control, that ability to fire things exactly when I want them is everything to me. Sounds good. Yeah, this is going to be probably a, a ballroom dance, um, in, uh, you know, event. So that's the situation I'm, I'm looking at. Yeah, for that. So you're not going to have a lot so, of not not any speeches or anything like that. It's just music. Yeah, probably. Yeah, if you're just doing music, I don't know that I'd bother with an external mixer. Um, one of the issues, especially I see with people that are new to audio chain workflows that uh, that tends to trip them up is they don't properly set levels, so they just kind of turn everything up until they can hear it, and then you have this hiss because they haven't properly adjusted their headroom. Those kind of things can be uh, frustrating to, to those of us that show up at these events and go, why didn't that guy set that up right? So the less stuff that you can start with to begin with, probably the better, and then you can always expand out and, and make your setup more elaborate as your needs increase. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that sounds great. I'll look at that stuff over. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the call. one 450 no it's 855-450-6624, or you can send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. Eric, the IT guy, still with me. We're chatting about PeerTube, and uh, just right before that phone call, we were talking about um, YouTube and the, and the responsiveness of YouTube and how PeerTube kind of matches up to that. Um, and I think we started talking about ads as well. The second thing that I, or the third thing that I see from YouTube, Eric, is that it's very, very featureful. There are a lot of features inside of YouTube and it allows for tight integration into other platforms, embedding, so on and so forth. How is PeerTube in that regard? Does it offer the ability to embed? Can you do live streams? How about things like timestamping? Are any of those a possibility? A lot of those features are still in the works. Um, this is a project that dates back to 2015, I believe. Um, but they didn't really hit a stride until this this past spring. They they launched a crowdfunder, and and to give you an idea of uh, of how much the community at large is looking for a solution like this, they made about three and a half times over their goal. I think it was like 65 wow. million U.S. dollars over a, a six month period. Um, I mean, they they really really got a, a huge backing. Um, so now, so since since about March, when I when I first heard about the project, they have been adding more and more features every day, and they just released version one dot oh dot one last beginning of last week. Um, so I mean, it's it is a great platform for what it does, and so now that now they now that they've hit one dot they're really starting to focus more in on features. And, and you alluded to uh, how responsive are they? Well, um, as, as someone who's growing in the open source community, PeerTube was actually the first time I ever, uh, ever submitted a, a request on, uh, on GitHub. Um, so it was, a, it was a feature request. And within a few weeks, um, we, uh, not only did they take the, the feature on, but uh, it was in the very next release. So they, they've been doing an amazing job of, of uh, listening to the community and, and figuring out what features are, are most desired and, and getting those added in. Uh, for instance, I know in either the next release or the release after will be uh, some functionality to, uh, to set uh, prioritization levels for your transcoding jobs. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a broadcast company who has you know, 10 years or whatever of, of, uh, of backlog, it's going to take a really long time for PeerTube to ingest each of those videos, transcode it into multiple, multiple different uh, resolutions. You know, you've got 1080p, 720p, and then down to your mobile devices, um, and then, and then publish those videos. But at the same time, you're still making content every week. You know, if you look at Ask Noah show, there's, 
there's upwards of 80, 90 shows right. that would have to be ingested into a brand new instance. Yes. Well, that's going to take some time. But every Tuesday, the show happens. Uh, so you you're definitely want the new content out as soon as it, as soon as it can be ingested and, and transcoded. You want that published immediately. Um, so uh, PeerTube is working on code to prioritize anything that is current, uh, put that to the top of the top of the list and then when you don't have anything that's been released within the next within the last you know 14 days then then just go back to chewing on the backlog that is so cool i i absolutely love that so the website is joinpeertube.org of course you can always chat with eric in the telegram group telegram.asknoahshow.com make sure to join that because the conversation continues 24 7 365 we'll go to the phones 1-855-450 noah that's 855-450-6624 good evening you're on the ask noah show what's on your mind Hey, you know, it's Chris in West Virginia. Hey, I had a question about uh, the PeerTube. Okay. So going going to PeerTube.com, obviously that's not where I go to look for videos. So you have to know someone's PeerTube server, I assume? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so if you go to joinpeertube.org, uh, their, their main webpage, there in the top menu is a is a uh, menu option called instances. Um, that's that's what they call the the federated servers. Uh, it's called an instance. So if you go out there to the instances page, you can see a list of everyone who's running a PeerTube instance uh, that has gone back to to the main website and and listed their their site. So um, the Linux Rocks is on there. Um, our, our friends over at Jupiter Broadcasting have their their PeerTube instance uh, registered. Um, and there's a, a couple of others. I, I haven't uh, I haven't done a lot of digging recently, but um, I can tell you over the past six months that that list of available instances has has just gotten bigger and bigger. And not not to go off on too much of a tangent from your question, but one of the great things about the instances list is you can log in as an admin to your PeerTube instance, and you can follow these other instances. So if if there was a lolcat uh, instance and you love watching uh, funny cat videos, then you can actually follow that instance from your personal PeerTube instance, and they'll show up on the on the uh, on the main main page on the main feed. So you can really you can really con you can really contour the the content that you're looking for uh, based on what your inter, inter, interests are. Okay, I had another question, but that sparked a third one, if I may. Oh, go for it. <laughs> The, the, the second question I had was you said, uh, as you start watching these videos, um, if it's just you watching a video, you're just watching the video. If there are several right. people watching it, does just the, app, just the act of watching it put you in the torrent group? So is it using some web UI torrent um, API or something, or it, does your instance – offer the torrenting to the other videos? Um, it's, it's a, not to sidestep your question, but it's a little bit of both. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure of, of the nitty gritty details, but once that second client joins, and, and when, you, when you're streaming a video off of PeerTube, if you, if you look at the menu bar across the bottom of the video, it'll tell you how many clients are connected. So once you, once you go from one to two clients, um, that's when that's when the torrenting piece kicks in, and so the the PeerTube server um, and all the clients watching that video become seeders of that of that video. Hey Chris, I'm going to ask you to go straight to your third question because I've got I've got a uh, I've got my friend my uh, my next guest Fred Gleason standing by. Oh, well, sorry, I lost it. So go ahead. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Again, join Thank Peer... Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Yep, no worries. Thanks for calling in. one 855 no, 855-450-6624, or the email is live at asknoahshow.com. Eric, the IT guy, he's my guest right now. Join peertube.org. Thanks, Eric, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Noah. Yep. one uh, 855 Again, uh, 
Phone lines are open, but we've got our next guest, Fred Gleason. He's my guest this hour, the Ask Noah Show. Fred and his co-founder, Scott Spillers, were looking to implement an automation system that would work with all of Salem's communications formats and unable to find a system that had the functionality, stability that they needed for their mission critical broadcasts, Fred and Scott pooled their years of experience and created a brand new audio delivery system called Rivendale Automation. Now, Rivendale is used throughout hundreds of stations worldwide, including right here on KEQQ 88.3 FM in Grand Forks. It's one of the most user-friendly, robust systems available. And best of all, it runs on Linux and uses open source software. So joining us is my guest, Fred Gleason. Hey, Fred, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, how are you doing? Excellent. So first of all, thanks so much for taking the time to be here and, and chat with us. I, I guess start from the beginning. Tell me the story of how you started Paravel Systems and why. Paravel Systems uh, started when uh, Scott and I perceived a need in the uh, wider radio industry for an organization that can support uh, Rivendell in an installation Open source software has many benefits, but one of the things that makes it scary if you're looking to use it in a commercial environment can be, what do I do if it's 2 a.m. in the morning, I have a problem, I'm off the air, how do I fix this thing mm. to get back on the air again? Paravel Systems is an organization that you come in and you, you, you can buy a support contract with us that gives you a number that you can call 24-7 and get somebody on the phone within 15 minutes who can help you solve your problem. That's fantastic. Uh, that, 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 is, that, is, that is our core role as, as, uh, as Paravel Systems. So Paravel Systems came after the, uh, the invention, as it were, of Rivendell. Is that correct? That's correct. I was actually working... Uh, for a, uh, a, a, a large broadcast organization that does a lot of long-form uh, Christian programming. And uh, back in around uh, 2000, 2001, they perceived a need for a system that was well-optimized for that kind of programming. And the systems that were all available commercially, of which, of which there were a number, uh, had a baked-in assumption that most material averaged three and a half minutes long with a song and would be interspersed with commercials, uh, which was not the way that organization did most of their programming at all. So I was commissioned uh, to come up with a system that would, that would operate the way that company uh, did uh, radio. Uh, the result, about two years later, was Rivendell. You create this... Um this, I'm going to call it an appliance. That's the that's the uh, phraseology you use on your site. Talk to me about your decision to treat this as an appliance rather than a program or an app. Well, that's interesting. The the appliantization, if I could coin that term, actually came later. Rivendell, as an open source project, it is actually a suite of programs that uh, run on Linux that uh, mutually cooperate with each other to, uh, to result in a radio automation system. To package that as an appliance with something we did at Paravel to, to make it easier and non-intimidating for people who are not Linux gurus to install on a system name. Let's say I'm not a radio station with a large budget. Let's say I'm just a geek at home and I like playing with toys. One of the advantages and one of the things that we always celebrate Linux and other open source projects with is you don't have to have a large checkbook to start playing with the stuff. Um, that is true, of course, of Rivendale. What operating system do you recommend that people, I mean, I know Linux, but specifically which distribution would you recommend that people use to get started with Rivendell if they're playing with it on their own? All of our uh, appliances are based on the CentOS uh, distribution, which is uh, derived from uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, though it is not Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I, I will be quick to add that qualification. And the reason we chose that is... Uh, it's a, it's a very stable, uh, widely deployed system. It's designed for use in uh, business environments where downtime equals bleeding lots of money. Uh, and it's designed to be very stable, uh, 
going forward for years. In fact, the standard support interval for a CentOS major release is 10 years. Right. Uh, this is in contrast to many of the alternatives who will last for 18 months and then they kind of evaporate and go away. And uh, for for radio operators, that's, that's an unacceptably uh, short uh, time period. Sure, it's gotta be built to last, absolutely. You made a decision early on that you were going to go with Linux and an open source based model for this mission critical broadcast gear. What led to that decision? Uh, code quality and reliability for the most part. Um, the advantages of open source are widely recognized in the industry now. The primary one is it gives you peer review. If your uh, work uh, method is process secrecy, the way it was for many years in IT, um, the code you released often contained, uh, well, not only bugs in the, in the operation of the program, but security flaws that could make you uh, vulnerable in our interconnected, interneted world uh, today. Open source is an open book. It lets everybody see the recipes by which the program is constructed. I receive feedback on pretty much a daily basis from a community of folks who follow Rivendell, work on the code for it, and I receive fixes from them all the time that both improves the product and also improves the security of the product. That applies not only to Rivendell itself, but to the underlying CentOS operating system that it is based on. For those of you who aren't aware, um, we're talking about this broadcast appliance. Uh, to put it into into basic terms, when the program starts and you hear that intro music, that is being fired out of one of the applications in Rivendell called RD Airplay. And so there is a, we call it the log, but it's essentially a schedule of content that is to be played at a specific time. And so when, when you hear the program starts, you hear that intro, that's RD Airplay kicking that off. Now, when we queue a, a clip or, or something that we have we have clipped out, those are a series of buttons that's also built into RD Airplay that we have on a touchscreen here at the studio. And so I can just touch it and it fires off one of those clips. And Fred and his team and the, and the community at large has worked to automate this entire process. So when we, for example, have a new piece of audio that needs to get into the system, all of that is essentially scripted with uh, scripted maybe is the wrong word, but automated with a program called RD Catch. As Fred explained it, it works in conjunction with RD Airplay. So RD Catch goes out to our various sources and pulls in the clips or resources that we want to use on that week's episode and then pulls it into a bar for me that I can just fire that off. And that that straightforward, absolute, rock-solid reliability is what allows us to trust the system to run uh, this studio and the entire radio station. Fred, for those that want to get started with this, how do you recommend if, they're, if they don't have the budget to actually buy one of your well-produced appliance-based systems, how do they go about installing Rivendell? Well, you can go to ParavelSystems.com and you will find a link there to a site that will give you instructions for installing the system, downloading it completely off the internet. You can also go to wiki.rivendellaudio.org, which is the Rivendell site, and that will have links to that same location. You can actually install and run uh, Rivendell on your station or your web station uh, without knowing us or anybody else a dime. Uh, it, it, it is free and open source and uh, out there available. And often the next question I get from people when I tell them that is, how do you guys stay in business? Well, the way we sell, stay in business is by selling support in, uh, uh, agreements for that. If you're putting that into an environment in which, uh, as with many radio stations, making your payroll every week, it's going to be a matter of that system working reliably, then you often want some sort of expert standing behind that system. That's the role we fill in parallel. 
Absolutely. And it follows the Red Hat model. They'll give you this. I mean, you can go download. That's essentially how CentOS came to be, is somebody took the source code from Red Hat and effectively recompiled it into uh, into CentOS and said, okay, here here's the, essentially the code base of Red Hat with all of the trademark stuff removed. And, and here it is, and people can use it for free. And the number of times as a daily IT contractor that I've gone out to a site and said, oh, well, okay, you're using CentOS. It's working very well. Now we need to add some support and we need to layer that with a structure behind you. Let's move it to a red hot box. Nobody is opposed to that because we already have trust in the system. And the fact, Fred, that you are able to put this product out there, this software out there and say, listen, you try it, you play with it, not some handicapped version, not some 30 day trial, put it into production in your station. You try it, see how it works. And if, when you come to the same conclusion that hundreds of other people all the way, all across the United States have come to that, and actually around the world, I happen to know it's used worldwide. When you come to the same conclusion that we have, that this is the best broadcast automation software out there, we're standing by and for a nominal fee, we'll go ahead and support you and make sure that your your station stays up. You had mentioned something interesting. You mentioned internet stations. And I think that applies to a large range of our audience because we have podcasters in the audience. We have internet broadcasters. This is a professional grade broadcast appliance that is capable of running uh, a large radio station, but it can also be used given its flexibility and its cost effectiveness for smaller internet stations. Does Rivendale support streaming? It does. Uh, we have some auxiliary modules that can be used that will originate streams to IceCast or HLS. There is also a full podcasting system uh, built into Rivendell that uh, enables that mode of distribution, if that's what you're using. Have you had anybody, or have you heard it? Have, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to add, we also have a number of integrations to uh, to popular stream providers, such as Live 365 and so forth. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty easy to get started with it if you're a webcaster. Have you heard of anybody, or do you know of anybody, or do you guys maybe even officially support, I don't know, the idea of running Rivendell on like a virtual private server up in the cloud and maybe streaming some of that content out. And so you maybe you don't have a reliable place with a reliable Internet connection at your home or at your office. And maybe you could put that up on a VPS. Do you know of anybody doing that or has anybody played with that? Uh, I know people have more than played with it. I know people that are doing it. Uh, and uh, running it well. So, yes, it absolutely can be adapted to a to an AWS environment or a cloud environment, yes. That's fantastic. I think that's, you know, just between you, me, and the wall and the thousands of people that are listening to us, I think that's probably where a lot of the future of radio automation is, is moving that up into these ultra-reliable data centers where the radio station just kind of hangs off of the cloud. I, I think there's a market for that. Um for those that are not in broadcast and don't understand broadcast engineering as maybe you or I would, could you explain the, the GPIO functionality of Rivendell and, well, the Rivendell suite, I should say, and the macro functionality? How do those functions work? GPIO is, is, is a uh, acronym that stands for General Purpose Input and Output. And Despite the intimidating name, the, the concept is really uh, quite simple. It's similar to a light switch. You have an input that can be on or off. So you can actually connect these on and off wires into a Rivendell system. So say you want to have some particular function happen in the automation when that switch is turned on. That's what GPIO does, or you want something else to happen when it turns off. You can enable all of those kinds of activities in Rivendell. One of the key technologies that enables that kind of interaction is the macros that you refer to. Macros are essentially a command language that lives within the Rivendell suite that all of the module pieces of it understand. So you, you can actually write a script or a macro cart, as we call it, that, for example, would do something that when a particular GPIO line is turned on, uh, then uh, play this promo on the air. Uh, it gets much, much more flexible than that. Uh, it's really limited only by your imagination. If you want Rivendell to start your coffee pot at 7 a.m. in the morning, you can actually <laughs> do that. 
these are the kinds of things that that you've thought of in the middle of the night, and then you've written them down and integrated them into Rivendell. Uh, so uh, uh, while the coffee pot example is great, a uh, one of the more practical applications that we found here at the studio is the ability to start a com- to fire a commercial break right from the board. So we can, uh, from our console, we can hit a button and it will fire uh, our commercial breaks and we come in and out of them and stuff. And that way we're using physical controls to control the automation system. And of course the automation system is then talking back to the board. So th- that kind of functionality is just really fantastic. And I think it's something that a lot of internet broadcasters or, or, um, podcasters maybe don't think about because they haven't been in the environment where you have CD players and you had to, you know, start those CD, trigger that CD player to start or stop. And so when you start to look at computers, we just think that we always have to use a mouse or a keyboard to do all of the input when in fact the broadcast system can be smarter than that. And we can in fact tie all of these things together. You're, you're coming at an important theme in the design of Rivendell, uh, that Scott and I uh, decided at the very inception of it. And that was our goal was to make it so radio people or internet radio people could think about doing radio and not have to think about the process, the technology, the tools that come between the two of them, uh, between those two steps. So we, we've tried very hard in Rivendell to to make it work the way a radio, an experienced radio person would expect it to work. That's why a playlist is called a log, because if you've been in radio, a log is a list of stuff that you, that you play on the air. Uh, and that, that philosophy you will find in all the corners of Rivendell. That's absolutely fantastic. I love that. I love the, I love your mentality. I love your approach because you're putting the talent first. You're putting the users first. So many pieces of software are written from an engineer standpoint and uh, the naming conventions and all sorts of things are written from an engineer standpoint. And that can be frustrating as a talent. I just want to sit down and do my show. And Rivendell, what really spoke to me originally about the code quality of Rivendell is the fact that I forget it exists, quite frankly. It just kind of, It's just the machine that sits there and we just don't touch it because it just works all of the time. That's great. That means our, we've done our job then. Uh, that's great to hear. Has the community both inside and outside of the radio uh, community stepped up to help contribute, make contributions? code contributions to Rivendell? Absolutely. I, I receive code contributions pretty much on a daily basis. And uh, a lot of them wind up in Rivendell. Some of them, some of them get refined and taken in other directions, too. That, that's how an open source community works. Talk to me a little bit about the integration with Telos equipment. So we are a we're a Telos station. So we've got all Telos gear, and this studio is is um, all AES sixty seven Livewire standard. Talk to me about the 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 relationship that you have with uh, with Telos and how tightly Rivendell integrates. I know uh, a friend of mine, Kirk Harnack. Anytime he goes to deploy one of his stations. Um, if he can, he seems to always choose Rivendell, and I assume that has something to do with the tight integration of Telos equipment. Telos has been a friend of open source for, gee, at least the, early, the, the late 1990s. Uh, I can epitomize that with a little bit of a story, if you don't mind the, the discussion. I wrote a I wrote a, a program uh, back around 1998-1999 called Call Commander. It was a system for controlling on-air phone systems like the one I'm using to talk to you uh, right now. Uh, I posted that, uh, and, uh, and we actually sent out a press release about it. And uh, almost with a mischievous kind of intent, I went ahead and sent a copy of that, uh, that press release to uh, Telos. Uh, by the way, it was a program that competed with one that, that they were selling to their customers. So it was, it was, it was a little bit of an in-your-face sort of thing to do. And I, I was wondering about what the response I was going to get back. I got a response about three days later. later. It was a it was a forwarded email from Steve Church, who, who at that time was the owner and founder of uh, Telos. And it went something like this. This is so cool! Exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. <laughs> Put the link on the website. 
And so uh, Telos and Rivendell and Open Source have kind of been friends ever since. And uh, so as you point out, uh, Rip, Rivendell ha has hooks to a lot of different uh, manufacturers' broadcast gear. But I would say, uh, without doubt, the, the closest integration we have is, is with uh, gear made by the Telos Alliance, which would include that AES-67 uh, family that you just mentioned. So, and for those that don't know, AES-67 is audio over IP. Now, the audience is well aware, I'll just bring up to you briefly, Fred, that this entire studio runs on Linux. There isn't a Mac or Windows PC in the studio, and as long as I'm sitting behind the mic, there never will be. When we started looking for broadcast equipment, as you know, Telus Alliance makes really, really good stuff. They also demand a fairly hefty price tag for, for a reasonable price tag, but a hefty price tag as compared to some of the consumer gear. And um, as we looked into it and we looked into some of the alternatives, what we f quickly found was that we weren't going to run into any roadblocks if we use Telos gear, whereas some of their competitors required Windows-specific software. And so I'm proud to say uh, that all of this gear that is in the studio is Telos, and it has been flawless since the day we got it. Yes, we paid a little bit of money to get there, but we have an all Linux studio that I would easily put against iHeartMedia or Cumulus or, or any of the big names because I think we do things right here. And uh, I was very happy to learn early on that Rivendell, the basically my only choice for radio automation on Linux, as far as I'm aware, um, fits so hand in hand with uh, our Axia system. And so I, I guess uh, if we can talk a little bit about the audio over IP, Axia uh, sells the driver for um, you know the other proprietary platforms, but Paravel Systems is the one that either developed or developed with Telos the... Uh, IP over audio driver specifically for Linux. Yes, uh, they make a line of that for Windows, and they also have that. We also distribute a, uh, a driver for Linux that uh, can be used to accomplish that same connection uh, out of a Rivendell system. The advantage being that uh, instead of a fancy, expensive, professional sound card, you can. You can do everything through your the same network connection on the computer you use for everything else. So, and to to I I I and I, and I think to a certain degree, um, it actually is even more than that because so for example, when you have a machine, ordinarily what we would be doing is taking audio out of our playout system and turning that into analog audio. Then we would traditionally put it into an analog board. We'd mix it around, uh, digitally speaking, and then we'd spit it back out as an analog connection and then back into a digital converter to be broadcast out to the internet or wherever it is we're going. You have streamlined that process. So when audio comes into our studio as digital ones and zeros, it stays that way throughout the entire process because the playout machine is speaking IP to the board, is speaking IP back to the broadcast machine, and then IP out to the rest of the world. So we're maintaining that 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 signal integrity the entire time. The thing that I think that is particularly going to be appealing to our audience, I hear a lot about IP audio, and people are trying to do it with Pulse Audio, and they're trying to do it with Jack. And not that those are bad ways to go. They're great tools, and I'm glad that there are such talented developers out there that make those processes available to everybody that anybody can just set up, essentially, routed IP audio inside of their machines. But I think the thing that sets your driver apart is it's literally plug-and-play. You go to your repository, you purchase the driver, you install the software, you add the the uh, the software key into the driver that's installed, and then there's just a, a GUI control panel, and you say, I want this audio to go here and that audio to go there, and I want this many streams and this many to come back. And it's all very straightforward and intuitive that anybody can set up in, in 10 minutes. Yes, well, a lot of that is thanks to the genius of Steve Church, the uh, founder of Telos, who... Uh, who invented this entire live wire system that he was uh, derided and laughed at and mocked by the radio industry for a long time. And guess what? Now everybody is imitating him, uh, which seems to be the fate of, of technical innovators uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of times. It, re it, it really does simplify setting up a studio greatly. One of the things I really like about Rivendell is that it actually captures the audio device. And so you can't accidentally, uh, it doesn't accidentally send audio out over the wrong place and nothing else can take over and accidentally insert audio into your audio chain. 
Well, that's the point. We want the device to be always available to the automation. We don't need the Microsoft sound being put on your airwaves. Thank you very much. Lastly, I'll just, uh, I know we briefly touched on this, but if somebody is interested in setting this up for a uh, professional broadcast, or maybe they have gone to rivendellaudio.org and installed Rivendell on their machine, and now they're ready to take it to the next level, um, either of those scenarios, either I just want to give you a credit card and I want a box to show up that I just plug in and use it, or I want to, I want to layer support onto my existing working system. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Paravel Systems. That's what you guys do there, right? Yes, we will support either model. Uh, a turnkey system that we ship to you, and we'll even send you the engineer to install it and train your staff. Uh, kind of, kind of the red carpet treatment. Or uh, if you have your own computer hardware that you've acquired locally, uh, you can install the software appliance onto it. If you have someone who is uh, knowledgeable about doing those things, and, 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 and we will certify and support that tip. His name is Fred Gleason, the engineer and co-founder of Paravel Systems, paravelsystems.com, founder of the Rivendell Radio Automation System, an open-source, Linux-based automation system for broadcast. Fred, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us on the Ask Noah Show. We'll get you back on the program real soon. Well, thank you very much. I've been glad to be here. Again, open phone lines this hour, 1-855-450-NOAH, 855-450-6624, the email live at AskNoahShow.com. Make sure, if you're listening to the show, to get the best possible audio quality. Um, we just talked about the tight integration with um, all of the Telos products. Of course, we have a Telos audio processor here, and that will get you the best audio quality, but it's only available at AskNoahShow.com. So if you listen to the show anywhere else, make sure to point your browser to AskNoahShow.com. Additionally, if you're if you're if you're listening on the phone, um, we've optimized it for mobile, so you can just open the browser, hit play. You can close out of the browser or shut the phone off, and you'll, the show will continue to play. And, of course, you just open that browser back up, and you can pause it or stop it if you decide that you're you're done listening. We've got a number of really cool episodes upcoming again. We're doing a couple of special editions to accommodate um, some very special guests and get some very important information out to you. Coming up in the next couple of episodes over the next week will be Jason Donafield from WireGuard. He's going to give us a detailed deep dive into this extremely yet simple, fast and elegant modern VPN technology that uses state of the art cryptology. Richard Hip will be a guest. He's he is the architect and primary author of SQL Lite, as well as Fossil uh, SCM. He's going to join the Ask Noah Show to tell us how and why the COC controversy is affecting the SQL Lite project, a database system that's used in pretty much every device that you own. Eric Dubois from Arco Linux. Arco Linux is an Arch-based Linux distribution that it doesn't just let you use Linux, but it will teach you about Linux. It will let you explore Linux. It's, I would equate it to the Raspberry Pi of the Linux distribution world. It's a fantastic piece of software, something that I think in the upcoming months, in the upcoming years, we are going to spend a lot more time talking about here on the Ask Noah Show. Our broadcast schedule for the next couple of weeks looks something like this. October 30th, Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central, our normal broadcast time. Of course, we'll take your calls, 855-450-NOAH, 855-450-6624. As a matter of fact, the phone line will be open all of these nights. November 2nd, 9 p.m., this is going to be a very special night. If you don't make it for any of the other episodes, make sure to check this out. We're going to have a community night. We're going to focus on interaction from the Mumble Room at mumble.jupiterbroadcasting.org, as well as we're going to set up a dedicated chat room specifically for this show. That will be at Freenode Pound Ask Noah Show. So make sure to join that IRC, not our typical meeting place. But for this community episode, community night, we want to do that. That'll be November 2nd at 9 p.m. November 3rd, 9 p.m. November 4th, 9 p.m. November 5th will be 6 p.m. And then November 6th, that will be our usual uh, day, Tuesday, but we can't do the show at 6 p.m. like we usually do. It'll be the first time in the entire history of the show that the show won't be at 6 p.m. on our usually scheduled day. And the reason for that is the midterm elections here in the United States. My buddy Brad Schmidt from The Schmidt Show, him and I will be doing election coverage. That will be live here in Grand Forks, streamed on AskNoahShow.com as well as the Schmidt Sh as well as theschmidtshow.com. But you can join us and we'll feed you some food and we'll have a couple drinks and a great time if you're in the Grand Forks area. And that will culminate to our 100th 
episode of the Ask Noah show on November 7th. We'll be celebrating 100, 6 p.m. in Minneapolis, St. Paul. So make sure to join us if you're in the Minneapolis area. We'd love to have you and we'd love to meet you, shake your hand, and have you sign our 100th anniversary episode uh, poster that we're going to have. If you're not already doing so, we invite you to subscribe or download the show at podcast.asknoahshow. There you'll find um, all of the show notes and all of the articles referenced in this episode. Of course, you can get the latest news by following us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. We'll be back to, uh, well, Tuesday night at 6 p.m. A huge thanks to Simon Quigley filling in his call screener uh, and better producer. And you guys have a great week, and we'll see you on Tuesday. Tuesday.